thank you very much for the nice introduction. And yeah, hi and welcome from my side on this live coding talk about why you want to code with Quarkus. So it's going to be, I hope, a fun live coding session. And I'm very, very happy to be here in person. And it's actually my very first time uh, in Israel. So I'm, I really enjoy it so far. So I'm really happy. And I also want to say just a short appreciation for this nice flower decoration. I think that's nice as well. So after the talk, you feel free to uh, come to the front and appreciate it. And I have some stickers for you for Quarkus. So who wants some small presents, please come here. So yes, um, my name is Sebastian, originally from Munich, Germany, and I'm uh, working as a self-employed sort of consultant, uh, trying to help companies with all sort of enterprise stuff. Here you can see a lot of Java titles involved, so I'm very much in this Java space, um, but in general in the bigger enterprise space. And in this talk, I want to just yeah live code a lot and trying to convince you about why to use Quarkus this cool, interesting, supersonic, subatomic Java, uh, has, as it says on the website. So just a quick poll, who of you has tried out or even used Quarkus, hands up? Okay, quite a few. Who of you is using Spring? Okay, most of you. Who of you is using some other Jakarta EE, Java EE, J2 EE? Okay, okay, so almost everybody's Spring. Okay, that's gonna be interesting. And, Yes, yeah, so basically what I will do here in the talk, so that's almost all of the slides that I have because I mostly want to live code because I think it's just more fun and interesting to watch. So what I have is this Maven project that I call Quarkus Playground. So that's a playground uh, project where I can do stuff. And uh, this is using Quarkus in a recent version and Java 17. Who of you uses Java 17 or onwards in production? Oh. More than I thought. Okay, that's good. For everybody else, you know, migrate to a recent Java version. And yes. <laughs> so basically how this Quarkus uh, works, and you can have a look at the website, and there's also code.quarkus.io, which is very similar to what Spring offers with the starter, is that it you have to add certain dependencies, and then you just build your project. And at the very beginning, what I want to show you is just how to build and run a project, which is... Super simple, you just uh, run your Maven build. I use this Maven package. And then what it does, well, it builds your project, um, in this case, to an executable jar, and you can run it. So, well, as always, right? Well, almost. Because what is kind of cool about this, uh, what you can do um, is the following, that if you say, well, I would like to go and now run this. Actually, I have to see if this works as follows. If I go and run my Quarkus app, like this, and I'm trying to execute it, enter, and then it starts up. Okay, now what you see, it starts up actually quite quickly. I have to admit, okay, quickly, this is one second, which is a lot. Usually it's like point something seconds on a recent computer. I have to say this laptop is now more than five years old, five and a half years old, so usually it's much faster. But okay, fair enough. If you come from the Spring background or the Enterprise Java background, Probably you don't have one second startup time, but a little bit longer, right? Okay, why is this the case? What does Quarkus do differently? So you see, this starts really fast. How does Enterprise Java usually work and Spring usually work? Well, it does as follows. You have a declarative programming model. So you write your Java classes and you annotate them, right? Like at AutoWired, at Controller, at Service, here in um, Java Enterprise and in Quarkus, it's at Inject. And then what happens at startup time your application or your spring runtime or your server starts to do some work and scans the whole world. You know, it scans for your annotation and tries to build up these meta models and does a lot of work that takes a lot of time. Quarkus does this differently. Quarkus does this at build time. So you have a Quarkus Maven plugin that does all of this magic at build time already, and it gets rid of all of the indirections, all of the inversion of control. And what ends up is direct Java invocation. So really kind of like simple code or actually very direct invocations in your code that you can just start up. And that's the reason why it runs so quickly because at runtime, everything is already done. You don't have to start and do all of this work. So that's why this works that quickly, which is actually the sort of prerequisite of what Quarkus is mostly, I guess, known for is the, the way since it came out in the beginning of 2019, that from the beginning, you could build native executables with Quarkus, which is quite a new thing in Java. So thanks to GraalVM and SubstratVM and some other technologies. And this is only possible 
because of how J uh, Quark is built this. Why? Because if you try to build something native, it's very complicated with reflection and all of these dynamics. It's not that easy, actually. So Quarkus does a lot of work up front so that you even get there. But the good story is these benefits always benefit you, even if you run just in a JVM mode. And most of my um, real world projects, most of my production projects, almost all of them actually, run in a JVM mode. So I almost always run in a JVM mode. And actually today I won't show you a native build because you can do a lot of things just with JVM mode already. And this is JVM, right? So I'm, I'm running Java. So that's just it. You can run it. You don't need native and you still get all the benefits. So that's one thing Quarkus is known for, and that's actually kind of cool for multiple reasons. But the other thing that Quarkus is known for is this development mode, Quarkus colon def for the Maven plugin. So that comes in the Maven plugin and what it does, it starts up your Maven, um, it starts up your Quarkus application in a way where it has the connection to your source code. So then you can cool, do cool things and I'm pretty sure you've seen this before. So now let's uh, go to my application and saying, okay, I'm running something local host and my project is about coffee, right? So I've been walking around uh, in Tel Aviv yesterday a little bit and I got some good coffee. So I like that here there are really good coffee spots. So here is my Hello World example that just says coffee. Okay, so fair enough. Where is my coffee example? This is uh, what is called a resource. So this is very similar to a Spring REST controller. So that's a JAX REST resort. So if you come from Enterprise Java, this, and these annotations are probably known to you. So that's basically well slash coffee on HTTP. And I can add inject something. I can inject another bean. You know, this is very similar programming model what you're used to. And then this coffee shop just has one method that says get coffee. And that's kind of like the hello world. Okay, fair enough. What you can do, you can change code here. And of course, that's the easiest change because I'm just changing some string. And then I just re-invoke this and very quickly, let's get rid of this here, I get the new response, coffee exclamation mark. I can do this again. So you see, I let my code running the whole time. So this Quark is dev mode is running over here. And you see the reload time is super fast, like 0.4 seconds. So it just very quickly detects the change and reload everything. Okay. This is very basic because that's just a text, like a string, a constant change. But you can do this with all kinds of changes. You can refactor your whole project. It will just try again, recompile again. If it fails, doesn't matter. It tries again, tries again. You can even um, add new dependencies. It knows about it. It will download the dependencies in the background. So it's really cool. You can just keep it running. It works very well out of the box. So the tooling here is really nice. And for those of you who have tried it, it's really fun. Because that's nice because you don't need to wait. So you do something here, you know, I change my code. Well, and then if I change my code, I hope you also have some tests available here, right? So this is my um, IDE where I say, okay, test the coffee. Okay, this test is like basic, you know, it just says hello world, it equals two strings. But what I want to show you is the response time or the turnaround time. So I do something, you know, I'm typing, typing, typing. And then I want to press a key and then I want to get the response. So the response here, of course, is kind of fast. Here, if you can read it, it says 100 milliseconds. So that's very nice. And what is even nicer is to run the whole thing in this console here. So here, if you can read it, you can press some keys. For example, I can have this continuous testing. I press the R key and then it runs my tests super fast. And if I actually want to, and this is really nice if you want fast feedback. If I want to run my test, I press it now and again and again and again. So this is even faster than your IDE. Why? Because if I do the whole thing in my IDE, you can try this out yourself. I'm pressing the key now. And then it's like, okay, now it's running. You see? There was like a delay of two, three seconds, which is okay, but still, you know, we're human beings. We get, we get bored, we get annoyed by waiting times. So just make it faster. And this is really nice there, but I will show you a little bit more about that in a second. For now, let's do a little bit more live coding, right? Because live coding is fun, everything can go wrong. So what I want to show you is to order some coffee and to get some coffee. I have everything here in a just, in a map, so basically in memory. I'm creating some coffees here that is just some very simple type, just some, well, Java class. And I store this in a map, which is in memory, which is boring because maps are simple, but also, you know, that's not really what your production project looks like. So we're gonna change this. Let me 
demo this just very quickly how that works. I say I have some list of coffee orders here that is usually empty. So that's a, well, a JSON array that is just empty. So now I would like to order something. I would like to create a coffee order by posting usually, you know, some JSON stru structure to this. So you can have a look at the um, resource. Coffee's resource, there's a second one. It looks like follows. Again, Jax REST, very similar to your Spring REST controller probably, right? A little bit different annotations. Here we have at get, at, um, at post, you know, different types than in your Spring code, but very, very similar. So we say, okay, please create this by some coffee type. You know, so what you usually have is like, I would like to order some drink type, you know, like you have some cappuccino or some espresso. So I'm going to create this by posting this to this URL, right? And I do this and then it says, yes, do one created. Okay, do this again. And then I can read my coffees that are here and see, okay, now I have two coffee in the system. Well, okay, that's easy. Now, how to make some persistence out of it? Because that's the interesting part. Okay, what we do, first of all, we are going to add some persistence in the dependencies. So this is this part where we have Quark is REST easy, is everything with Jax REST, so with REST, um, JSONB is same. And here we have these two dependencies, Hibernate, should be a name for you, ORM, Panache. Panache, we uh, come to that in a second. So it's basically, well, Hibernate. And the driver to the database, I will use a Postgres database, JDBC. Okay. So because of this, that's actually quite interesting. There is already a, um, a database running. For that, let's get rid of this for a second. And what I will do, I will quickly change my code. So my Quark is dev is still running. It's always running in the background because why not? It just, it will take care of itself. So that's fine. What do I need to do in order to introduce JPA? Well, here I want to use some JPA entities. So this should be familiar with you, right? Because if you use Spring Data JPA, these are the same annotations. So I have something like add entity, add table with some table name, right? Like coffees. Then of course, if I have an entity, you know, I need some ID. So that's gonna be the ID here. It's gonna be a generated value and I have my string. Okay, I make these things public here. You could also have privates and get us in status, but for, for this, that's totally fine. Okay, and then what I do, I just, um, well, restart everything here. Okay, what do we have here? That's already interesting. There is some exception. Um, fail to start Quarkus, why? That's a little bit um, default entity manager. I think I have to run this again because I started something in the properties. I will explain this in a second. So usually the Quarkus dev just keeps running, keeps running. In the worst case, you have to restart, which is like, you know, four additional seconds or so. Okay, so what it now does, it starts up the whole thing and I can now, um, is it, oh, it tries to use the Wi-Fi. I hope that's fine because it starts up something that I will show in a second. Okay, no, that's, no, that's good. Okay, so now this works and I want to create a coffee order again and get this, okay. So now that works as well. Well, I didn't change the code yet. I just add some annotations, but what it now already did, and I will show you this in a second. Now it started up um, a Postgres database, which is now running in my Docker container here. I didn't start this up. This one has just been started, a Postgres database. Why this is the case, it's called Quarkus Dev Services, and I will explain to you what it does in, in the background, but that's actually very helpful. But for now, I want to change the code that I'm actually using because maybe you, you notice I just added the annotations, but it's still loading the coffee from the hash map. So let's change this as well. What I do now, I really, you know, break something. If I now reload the application, it won't work anymore. So if I now say, okay, now it's getting some exceptions and it will tell you, okay, this stuff doesn't compile anymore. So, okay, we better uh, fix this. Okay, so what do we do here? We get rid of my hash map. I don't need this anymore. And what I need to do now is, well, I have now multiple options. This depends which way you want to go. And there are some nice guides uh, out there that will uh, show a little bit later. What you typically use in the spring world is spring data JPA or some similar things, right? So that's what most of you are using. I like the spring data repository approach. That's, that's quite nice. I think most enterprise developers are kind of um, are familiar with that. 
Um, Hibernate Panache offers multiple approaches. There is something similar to an active record pattern, which I'm personally not that much of a fan. Um, but there's also a repository pattern, which I will show you. Also, what you can do, you know, Entity Manager. I think that's also what you are familiar with. You know, these, this plain old thing, um, something like this, which works, but it's not that handy because the API is not that nice, right? You always have to have multiple invocations of the stuff like Entity Manager, Get Result, blah, 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 Create Query and things like that. No, what we want to do is a different thing. We want to create a class and um, insert. that is called coffee's res uh, not resource uh, repository if i can type repository which is that should be an application scoped bean as well and this will implement a panache repository which is very similar to a spring data repository of a specific type that would be coffee which will be a repository that auto-generates or includes all kinds of methods that you need for this coffee type. Actually, I'm not using this one. You can use this type if you have a long ID. I don't. I have a UID as ID type. So if I use Panache repository base, then I can specify the um, ID type and have a different one. And that's already enough. I could add some extra methods, but you will see that this abstract base class, that this already includes all sorts of methods that you would like to have. And again, this works because of the way how Quark is built your code at build time. So I can say, let's call this repository. I can say I simply invoke this by saying return repository. And then there are all sorts of methods here that all come from um, the, the base class. And I say, find by ID and you see it already has the correct types because of the parameterized type. So I see, okay, just find by ID and return this. And this one is uh, also pretty cool. I simply can say, well, list all, you know, I think it's very similar to what you have with Spring Data repositories. I like the Panache way um, of repositories a little bit more if you have to extend it because this works really well. So it doesn't try to auto detect something with a method name, but instead it has nice fluent methods where you can you know, define them your, um, in your own way. Okay, now I say um, persist is the name. Here I want to persist this one. I don't have to set the ID myself. It will be a generated value. And persist, you can read uh, here the documentation. It will say, okay, it will return a managed uh, entity already. So with this, uh, this one, um, it will persist this entity. So then it will return one that already has the ID. So this should work that the ID then can be returned for the location HTTP header. Okay. So I now just quickly change this. Let's see if this works. I restart here and then I say, okay, give me the list of coffees. Now it's empty again. Okay. Let's try to create one. Now this fails. Probably you know why. That's a typical error that I just here made on purpose. Transaction is not active. And it nicely even tells me, consider adding tra add transactional to your method. Well, you know, obvious. We, you need to have this in an active transaction. So what you do? Well, you add add transactional to this method or to the whole class so that the whole thing uh, works in this way. Again, the nice story is that you can just Try it again, try it again, because the development mode is still running. So you see the turnaround time is very low. You don't need to wait for that restart. Okay. Now, what did it do? Or did it just restart? Let me check. That's empty. It said created. Oh, here it is. Maybe there was a restart in the background. Okay. So here, now we have the espresso there. Okay, where does the espresso now come from? Let's have a second one, yes. Well, it comes from the database. Well, which database? This has been started in the background and that's kind of helpful in Quarkus. You can go to um, localhost 8080. Well, I could go to coffees or this doesn't make sense much uh, in the browser or I go to slash Q slash dev, which only works in the development mode, which is a dev UI. And it shows you, I hope that's not too bright. Um, it shows you that um, it has here some dev services. I need to check where they are. Um, here are dev services. That included Postgres as, well, that's quite nice as a test container provided Docker Postgres. So this is very nice. Why did it do it? Because I didn't configure it. 
I just deleted the configuration before. So I didn't configure the database yet. So of course, this doesn't work for production, but during development this is very helpful that Quarka says, hey, you would like to add a database. How do I know that I would like to add a database? Well, because I added um, the dependency in the POM, right? So I added this one, but I didn't configure a database. So because of that, it will start up a database for me. I could, of course, disable that or the, the correct way, how you would usually do it, is to just um, to just add some properties for your database connection. So typically something like this that you say, okay, I would like to have a, a Postgres database with my credentials and things like that. Okay, once I do that, of course I need a database running at that because that's, you know, then the, the magic is over, then I have to configure this myself. And then you can use all sorts of things to run this. So later today, um, Alek Shalaif will give a talk on test containers, which is quite interesting. I usually, well, that's a longer story. I usually don't use this. I use a, like a more standalone way to run this. So usually what I do, um, I just run that something like in a shell script to say, okay, Docker run my Postgres database because for development purposes, that is just faster. So what I will do now, let me stop this again. So it stops the other test containers approach. I will now run my database myself. And then it will not start up the dev services by a Quarkus because I now have my database, you know, in my own way. I could, of course, configure it against a cloud instance or something else. So I have a lot of options there. And now what I can do is to say, okay, now I have my database running here. Postgres. I gave it a name. It's called Coffee Shop DB and it's up and running. I just started it up and now I can have the same thing. Let's do my um, curl again. So now curl again, of course, it's now empty. And if I create a new coffee and espresso and maybe now to have something else, a latte and another one, I should have three coffees here. Okay, nothing new. But now where do these coffee come from? Well, they're now in my database and I can even have a look at it, right? I could go to Postgres and say, okay, please go to my local host. I always forget the syntax. I think it's uppercase U or lowercase. No, this is lowercase. I, I always have to try. Oh yeah, that's correct. Okay, so I'm connected. This has a coffees table. So that's the, uh, the table here. Coffees, no. So the syntax and in general, you know, the, the Postgres, I, whoever came up with the syntax of these parameters, I, I don't know, I can never remember them, although I do it quite often. So I could go and say, okay, select from coffees, right? So you see, okay, obviously it's in the, in the database. Fun fact, you know, who knows how to quit this thing, you know? No, backslash Q, correct. Not exit. <laughs> Again, whoever came up with the syntax is not. Okay, so you see, it does work. It used my database and I can use this approach with Panache to uh, persist it. So I think that's a quite nice way to do this, um, especially in this repository approach, because then if I say, if I would like to have my own queries, so for example, you know, have something like list coffee, um, find all or list all uh, espressos, for example, whether or not that makes sense. I could say, okay, have my own, I think it's called filter. I always forget the syntax well, um, list. Ah, yeah. And then with a query, something like, I think type espresso it is. And then you can have your own um, query that then uses these things. In the worst case, you can also inject an entity manager here. I mean, you get the entity manager that is used under the hood and then you can do whatever you like. So then you can use the same um, JPL queries, your native queries, all of your stuff that you used to. Um, but usually that's more than enough or you know good enough to just create all of these use cases. So with persistence, we are really covered. I think this works really nicely and the integration is pretty smooth, like even during your development process. But usually for a more sophisticated application, you of course want to have something like properly configured. Um, you could even have, I mean, your typical Hibernate stuff, right? That you don't uh, create your schema automatically, but use a SQL script and blah, 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 blah. So that works quite nicely here as well. Okay, 
So that is uh, quite interesting. But now let's look a little bit into this very interesting, I think, topic of testing, right? Because that's another uh, thing that is quite important. We will hear about test containers later today. But it works really well with this Quarkus approach. And I, well, okay, that's a different story. It always, it's an important topic also when you're using Spring or any other uh, thing that you should not only have proper tests and not only have a reasonable test coverage, but make sure that your tests are integrated effectively while you're developing. While you're developing. That means having a short turnaround time. And this is really crucial because otherwise, you know, what happens, you just won't, don't want to test, right? So let's do a quick poll. If you build your project and you have your code level tests and you have some basic integration tests, how long do they take for the whole like, you know, local build? Does it take less than 10 seconds? Hands up. Okay, does it take less than one minute? Hands up. Oh, Jesus. Does it take more than five minutes? Okay, okay, at, at this point I will stop asking. This is now I'm a little bit shocked, like uh, nobody like less than one minute. Okay. What do I want to have? I show you now, and this is not about testing, but it's also, it goes quite, quite well with this Quarkus sphere. What I usually have is I, I have different criteria of tests and I mean not necessarily just from this testing pyramid, but also from the way how to run it and to how, you know, what the scope is. So a code level test, and it can be a plain unit test. It can be, you know, a little bit more sophisticated for me should execute really, really quickly. This is what, you know, this unit test does. It just instantiates Java code and it runs very fast. I mean, obviously. So it doesn't use any reflection. It doesn't use anything alike to the spring context test, which is really, really, I would say the biggest problem why most of the test pipelines run so slow, because, you know, you fire up an application, you fire it up every single time, usually for every single test case. You can optimize a little bit, but still you, you fire up stuff all the time. And what I want to do while I'm coding I want really fast feedback and I don't want to wait. I'm really impatient. I don't want to wait. So usually what I do, I have a few tests here. One I call smoke test or smoke IT. This IT is a Maven convention that you probably know, integration test. This test won't be executed per default if you run your Maven build. So it will just like ignore it. You would have to uh, call a different goal. And what it does, this one uses, what is this that is also part of my test code? It is um, a client that just connects to my running application. So in most of my test approaches, I do the following that I say, I don't want to mingle everything together in one class like Spring Test do or Test Containers do. Quarkus Test is something very similar. At Quarkus Test is pretty much the same like uh, the Spring Tests. Usually, I, I'm, I really don't like them. And for the reason is they're very nice to get started. You know, so the getting started Hello World ex experience is really cool. You know, one annotation and everything starts up and yay. But as you just raised your hands, once you get to a real world project, it gets slower and slower and slower because it always tries to start up everything. What I do instead is I want to separate the test lifecycle from the test environment lifecycle. So don't start up everything at once, start up things before and keep them running. And during the test scenario, assume that the stuff is already running. So what this test does, that's just an, um, well, smoke integration test that basically says, hey, are you running? It's the same what I did on a command line, going to the um, curl local host slash coffee and say, okay, is this equal to coffee, right? It's like similar to say, okay, what do I get here? Okay, coffee. And this already implies a lot of things. So first of all, that the response is correct, but also that my application is running, that the HTTP stuff works, that the configuration works, you know, and uh, etc. Okay, so for a smoke test, that's quite interesting. But the cool thing is you get the same short turnaround, the same development experience if I change something. So again, my application is still running. And if I say coffee, exclamation mark, right? So first of all, I want to see my code level test. So I just can press you know, R for test again. And then it says, hey, now this test failed. This one, coffee shop test, you know, just my code level test because Quarkus re-executes this as well. I can do the same thing in the IDE. I rerun my test, now it fails. Okay. If a test is failing, what do you do? Well, you delete the test, right? No, I hope not. So you change the test. So then I say, okay, rerun this and now you see it's green. Okay, now a test passing, perfect. Does my smoke IT test pass? No, it doesn't. If I now run it here, 
Why? Because it connects against, oh God, it's too small. Well, you can believe me. It doesn't pass. It's red. Um, and it says the same thing. It's not equal to coffee explanation mark. Okay. Now, this wasn't executed here. Why? Because this Quarkus def test behaves in the same way like uh, Maven. So it, it ignores all of the ITs per default. It ex excludes them. It's the same with, um, with your Maven Surefire plugin. You can change this dash d quarkus test exclude pattern because there's an exclude pattern that is set to you know star um, it. If you set it to an empty string, it will it won't exclude anything. It um, will run all of the tests. And now if I go and say start up my application, this is just a warning that the uh, table already exists. I rerun everything and says, okay, now this test failed because now this coffee smoke IT is also executed. Now it executed two tests instead of one. Okay, so let me change this. Why is this better? Well, because of test turnaround time. Before I had to go to my IDE and you know press this and say, okay, press, wait three seconds, and now I get the response. It's the same like pressing now and pressing now. Just faster response. So why it can do this? Well, because it, it keeps everything compiled and it, you know it's just executing basically an invocation, which is quite nice. And make no mistake, this is really important. Why? Because we're human beings and we get distracted and we get bored and we get annoyed. So if you run something, so you know, I'm I'm a millennial, and my generation is said to be really impatient. And it's true. But I would say it's not only a bad thing. Right? So if I run something that takes one second and you're like, okay, now it's done. You know, run it again. Okay, now it's done. You know, it's, it's kind of fine. You execute something and you can wait for it and now I can continue. If something takes two seconds, then you're like, mm -hmm. okay, now it's done. You know, it already gets a little bit more annoying, but you can still wait for it. And there is, has been a lot of uh, psychology science on that, you know, what the threshold is. And the threshold depends on your personality is about two and three seconds before you actually get annoyed and distracted. So something takes 10 seconds. Do, 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 do. Oh, where's my phone? I haven't checked, you know, social media in a while. And just, you know, you know what happens. You just get distracted. You check your emails, you look at Slack. And you don't even see that things are done then. And this is bad. And this is what usually happens, right? You start your, you start your compilation. Oh, let me get a coffee because it's just compiling, you know? And you're distracted. Don't do that, really. I, don't make me wait. And for me, it's really important. And I always do is when I work on projects, I try to build up an environment that doesn't make me wait. And with modern technology, you can do that. Also works in Spring. There's something like uh, called Spring Dev Tools. I, I heard that it doesn't work as flawlessly out of the box like this Quarkus Dev Mode. But hey, still, it doesn't have to be perfect either. If it's local development environment, and it can be a little bit hacky. You know, you can use shell scripts. It's totally fine. There's a lot of value in it if it doesn't make you wait because you just get you know a better experience. So can you do the same thing here with Quarkus? Yes, here. I have my code level test and I have an integration test that uses HTTP already in this quick way where I just say, rerun it, rerun it, rerun it, and it does work. Same thing if I change my test, you just saw it. Same thing if I change my production code because of the dev mode. Okay, let's go one level up here. Let's say, what if I want to have some more, you know, acceptance test or system test, however you want to call them. So here I have a system test project. If you can see it, that's in a separate Maven project. I often do this to have it just separate that it doesn't reuse production code under the hood. So it's just a separate thing. You know, if like you do a black box test, you know, you have your application here and here you write a sort of client, can be a different programming language. It's just a different thing that then uses it. Okay, what I do here, it's also just, you know, a hello smoke test, but here it actually creates something. So this is really like create a coffee order, check that the coffee order is in the system and then see if the information is correct. In other words, if my database persistence, everything works correctly, right? So otherwise I would get an error here. So what I do, I also create, and here you see no annotation, no spring test, no Quarkus test, no test containers. It's just plain JUnit. It just runs everything, you know, and it just runs this HTTP client that's very similar to what I just saw, you know, connect to local host and blah, 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 blah. 
and say, okay, create this coffee. You know how? Well, it's explained here with HTTP. Retrieve the coffee and verify that everything is successful. It does it here. Create the coffee. That's the same what I did on a command line. You know, like post, espresso, blah, 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 blah. And then it takes the coffee because it gets the ID as the URL, you know, HTTP. And it retrieves it again and equals that it's actually the same data. So that it implies that your persistent database connection, everything works as expected. Okay, so the nice story about this is, well, it also runs fast because it, you know, it doesn't have to start up anything. I'm not using test containers under the hood to start up my database and do all of that stuff. Don't get me wrong, test containers is an interesting technology, but usually I don't, well, I don't tell people to use it here for this type of tests. Why? Because of turnaround time. I don't want to wait. Can I run this? This is now a separate project system test. It's called, there we go. It's a different project, has its own Maven stuff here. Can I run this on the command line as well? Yes. Now, not with Maven Verify or something, but with Maven Integration Test. There is a plugin failsafe integration test, which is your standard way to run these ITs. You know, that's, that's a typical Maven way. That's, I didn't do this. That's just how you run these ITs. And then you say, okay, you know, now there are test failures. Actually, why? Oh, yeah, because of the other Hello World. So now that is the test that is failing. Basically, my integration test that connects from the outside and test this. Interestingly, this already, let me just quickly fix it. This already created some coffee because now it's actually using the use case, you know, like a client would, but in the browser or here in my command line, um, I can even prove this. I can say coffee, um, not coffee, coffees and say, okay, this just has been created. And if I go and say, um, I think length or something, JQ, yes. Now it's five. Now if I run this again, after two seconds, it should be six. So you see it actually creates coffee. So it actually uses this. Okay. First of all, it's quite nice because here you see within two seconds, I get the response of even an acceptance test. But can you make it faster? Actually, yes, you can. There is. So this is it's quite interesting. This is a separate project. This is not a Quarkus project. It's just a plain Maven project for, um, for Java. This just uses test dependencies. It's, it's just for testing. It's called system test, you know, ST. Okay. How I have to run this either in my IDE or on the command line using Maven, you know, or with some other tooling, but basically that's it. Can I run this using this nice Quarkus approach? Actually, yes, you can. I even did a, um, a video on that, which you can ch check out on my blog. Okay, the following, that's a little bit of a hack. That's a little bit of a workaround. Why? Because I'm, I have a non-Quarkus project. It's just a Maven Java project. And I misuse Quarkus in the Quarkus plugin to run this because it's faster. It's not meant to be, but it works, you know? So what I can do, I can say I created a profile that I call test that then adds show you this here again uh, well do this at home because it's only for local testing it just helps you it won't be executed somewhere you know in a ci cd pipeline that's a different story but i basically can say well just you know fetch this maven plugin because it's really cool and then just run my stuff here so i can say this test and then um quark is def or there's another goal quark is test which is only test so doesn't matter and then also please add a test exclude pattern because it's called IT, add everything here. And then this also starts up Quarkus. It doesn't start up an application because it doesn't have an application, but it just runs my tests. And then it runs them again and runs them again. And it actually creates coffee. So I can one, two, three, you see how quickly it works. And these are all my integration, you know, my acceptance tests that I'm running here. And this is how fast the whole thing should work. Because, and once you try this out yourself, you see this really is fun because it doesn't make you wait. It's just, you know, it's, it's really awesome. If you um, change something here, let me do this. Let's go back to a coffee shop and say, okay, I want to change it, you know, coffee. Okay, so if I say now the thing is coffee, coffee question mark, and of course, if the question is coffee, then the answer is yes, please. And what do I do? Well, I can rerun everything here, right? So I press R and you see, oh, 
now my test is failing. Okay, let's uh, change this coffee shop test. I have to go there and change this to question mark. Okay, now only one test is failing. Now only my smoke IT is failing. Okay, go to this one and change this as well, right? And now rerun this. Actually, it already runs it in background, so I don't even have that much time to switch my workspaces and it's already green. Okay, what about the next one? Okay, now this is failing. Okay, now let's go to the other coffee IT and let's change this as well. And you see what I'm doing now, it's already green. I don't even have time to, you know, reach for a coffee or be distracted because I'm, I'm always just staying on the keyboard and I don't have to wait. And such an environment is really, really helpful to just, you know, stay in this flow experience and that it doesn't make you wait. And that's really what I like about the Quarkus tooling those folks created a really nice experience actually since the beginning. So this, I think it's quite impressive from Red Hat. And it just works really nicely. And as a developer, it's really fun. And of course you can say, well, it's more productive. And ultimately you have to say it's also sort of safer because there is less, I would say there's less chance for bugs to creep in. Because every distraction, every waiting time is always a chance for bugs, you know, because you're like, oh, I have to think of the super exceptional corner case and things like that. And then you're distracted, you know, and then you check social media and then you forget about the super important corner case and, and things like that. So it's, it's important. Okay, so you can uh, try this out. For the remaining few minutes, I want to show you another interesting technology. Um, we have enough time to, you know, live code this. If you want to get started, um, there's this code.quarkus.io, very similar to what you know from the spring world. I always, I mean, I sometimes use this. I always change the POM XML then that is uh, created because for me, you know, I want it formatted and sometimes I throw out stuff that is, that is not required, but you can have some uh, things here to get started. Quarkus guides on the website, that's also very helpful just to uh, get started with this. I also will show you at the end, I'm offering, you know, some video courses in this and courses if you're interested to join. But now what I want to show you is this also interesting technology about templating that is called Quarkus Qt, Q -U -T, like Quarkus Templating Engine, which integrates very nicely with, well, with REST as the uh, dependencies suggest. And it's a very nice way to do server-side server rendered HTML, which is always, you know, in the Java world. I mean, in Spring, it's a little bit nicer integrated. That's true. You know, there are a few things with Time Leaf and what typically people use. In the enterprise space, this always has been an issue. You know, you can use JSPs. They're actually, you know, very old, but they do work in some scenarios. JSF is a whole different approach. So if you want to have action-based server-side MVC, um, like Spring MVC, basically, it works quite nicely if we say, okay, what about if I want to have a very basic website that shows my coffee orders? So I call this coffee controller. Typically, I call these classes controller. What is this? It should be a JAXRS class as well. So basically, um, also REST. But now I have something like I call this orders.html because why not? Okay, and what it should do, it should produce not JSON, but actually HTML. And if you know about JAXRS, this actually works. You know, you can have any other response. I can have JSON, XML, or HTML and say, okay, what I want to have, I want to create something here, something like orders. But now, instead of a string and creating this myself, I want to use this, well, technology. So how this works, you can inject a so-called template with at location that now I call orders HTML. That is of the type template. And then what you do here in your method, you return not a string, but a template instance. And then you can say, okay, template dot um, instance and return this. And then this works. And the Quarkus integration of JAXRS will make sure that the whole thing works, you know, with your default HTTP and uh, handling. Okay, where does the template come from? They out of the box resides under resources slash templates slash orders. Well, the name of your template. So that's that. And let's quickly create one. So let's call this uh, orders or coffee orders. Oops, H1. And then, well, this should hopefully work. 
So my quark is still running. If I just added the dependency, it would also work. It would just download it uh, in the background. Now let's go to orders HTML. And then it says orders, which of course is boring because this is just a static site. It didn't actually do any rendering or any templating. It just basically gave us the string. Um, what we want to do, well, now we want to include some things. So for example, we would like to have you know, some directives and now the IDE already supports it. <laughs> so I can say for order in orders, for example, this is a loop with these sort of handlebar type of syntax that I say, okay, have the uh, order type, for instance. So I can include this into a list. And then, well, this should work once I add actually this data. So that is just added, added in a manner that I think makes sense for action-based MVC, where I say, well, where does the order come from? This should now be a list of coffee. Well, of course, it comes from my class coffee shop that I now just inject. And then I add this here. And then I say, okay, um, coffee shop, get coffees. That, of course, loads everything from your database. So that's basically it. So hello world. Um, cute example. We reload everything. Now it probably, oh, class now found exception. Interesting. It probably I did something wrong here. Um, no, it should be fine. Let's restart. It's actually interesting why, why it did this. Okay. Probably because of some of the injection point, but you know, in the worst case, you press one character and everything's fixed. So now this loads it from the database and it will display your orders and you know, you can do things here. And that's actually kind of cool because, um, here that's quite basic. But you will see that oops, that all of the directives that you typically would need are included out of the box. So all of these, you know, like count for it and has next and things like that is included. So when I tried it out at first, I was really like, okay, wow, this is not just a toy. I'm actually using this in uh, production projects, although it's kind of like early. Um, it has been really included, you know, with the developer in mind, which I really like about Quarkus in general. And you will, if you try it out, you will see this yourself. It's not just a toy. It's not just a proof of concept. It really has been created for like, okay, production like stuff. So all of these things, you know, and more you can find to try out yourself. And just as a few more things in general, why you would like to code uh, with Quarkus. So we saw the developer experience and the fast turnaround time. I think this is one of the biggest benefits because the integration of the developer tooling, it works really, really well. You can reduce your turnaround time to less than a second, like literally, even if your machine is five years old. So that works really nicely. Um, it includes known APIs. It doesn't ship its own you know, stuff. It actually includes its own things uh, as well. But if you come from the enterprise Java space, there's a lot of APIs that you're familiar with. You know, you saw JPA. Spring, you know, with an asterisk, it's also supported. There's actually a dependency for Quarkus where it supports the Spring annotations. Not all of it, of course, you cannot just run a Spring application with Quarkus, obviously, but most of it, which is really helpful for migrations, you can, you know, keep most of the beans first of all, and then just run it with that. Provides a lot of glue integration as well, especially for async stuff, reactive. There's a lot of things out of the box that just work with a few annotation. Basically everything where Enterprise Java falls short. What is not supported in these standards yet can be uh, done with, um, with Quarkus. Panache, I think, is another uh, very cool reason. This works really nicely. And, of course, the thin deployment artifact and the Docker support, not just in the native mode, but also in the JVM mode, which is quite nicely uh, done, I think, because if you have a look at the... Let's go back very quickly. If you have a look at the target, uh, what is created here, and the Quarkus app, um, what works here or what is done is that your Quarkus run and your actual, you know, app jar is very, very tiny, just a few kilobytes. And all of the other things of your libraries and your dependencies is separated. Why is this the case? You could, you know, cram everything into a fat jar. Well, it makes more sense for Docker support. Why? Because of layered Docker um, container images. 
if you have a look at that, there's a huge optimization where you can have the build cache and also the transmission cache for your uh, Docker containers or containers in general. And this works really well. So this really makes sense and has been created in such a way um, in the JVM mode. So I'm actually using uh, Quarkus in the JVM mode uh, most of the time. There's not much time to explain a lot of that. It's always, you know, pros and cons, but uh, most of my production projects are JVM projects. This works really nicely in, um, in Quarkus. We've seen the Qt templating engine. That's another reason. And I think just another reason is, is the ecosystem and the support. So I'm not, you know, paid to, to say this. I don't work for Red Hat, but I've actually um, submitted a few other bugs and issues myself, and they were fixed like sometimes on the same day. So that's, it works really well. It's backed by Red Hat. I think everything open source, they really know uh, what they're doing. And, you know, that's kind of cool. All right. So I hope I could maybe convince you to at least give it a try. I think it's a very interesting uh, technology. If you want to get some stickers, there's some here. Um, if you want to learn more about it, you can also follow me um, on social media. I also um, offer some on-demand video courses on this. Maybe you're interested. Or if your company might be interested in, that's what I do mostly for my business, the so workshops and helping out people. So please feel free to contact me on that one. So you see, you know, some find us here. And with that, I hope it was entertaining and fun to watch. And thank you very much for your attention.